Hello and good morning. It is Thursday, it's 10 o'clock, it's time for Bible study. And why don't we begin with a song as we usually do. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take Him at His word Just to rest upon His promise Just to know, thus saith the Lord Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him How I proved Him more and o'er Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I've learned to trust him, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that thou art with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. God, we welcome your presence here this morning. We trust you with all of our hearts. And we ask that as we go forward today in studying your word, you would open our eyes to what is indeed important to us. Help us to know what we can do, how we can respond to your urging and your direction. And at the end of the day, we ask that you would help us to trust you more and more as we find those things that are beyond our control and things that you have set in motion and that you take care of. We trust you and we love you. In your name we pray, amen. All right, hello and welcome. We say hello to those who have joined us already, Judy, Diane, Jason, and Pat. And uh, already I've got a comment on my shirt. Thank you very much. This, uh, this shirt is representative of the direction that we're going to go today. It's kind of all over the place. <laughs> so I'd like for us to first uh, wrap up the book that we have started, and that is uh, the book by Matthew Skinner called Acts. It is, uh, see if I can remember the title here, um, dun, dun, dun. Acts, Catching Up with the Spirit, Matthew Skinner. And I have uh, really enjoyed uh, his insights on the book. I've enjoyed the way that he's laid out the book of Acts. Uh, greetings to Diane, who's joined us. And uh, I like it how he's kind of broken it up into topics instead of just taking on the whole thing. And we have not... Uh, we have not covered each and every part of the book of Acts, but uh, this, I think, gives us a good sense of what the, the general purpose of this book is. And we're going to look at the afterward uh, as we start today, and uh, we'll just kind of wrap up our thoughts on this book, and then we'll see what we have in store for us after that. And... Let's go ahead and start here. So this is the afterward, looking back and looking ahead. And we're going to be looking at the last two verses of Acts to, to see how that um, kind of brings a conclusion to things. So I'm going to Bible Gateway, and we're going to look at Acts 28, verses 30 through 31. Uh, when it says he, this is talking about the Apostle Paul, who at this time has made his way all the way to Rome. And he is imprisoned. He is, I believe, wait, awaiting trial before the emperor. 
And in, in all likelihood, uh, it, it doesn't look good for Paul. I think tradition and history tells us that he was indeed uh, executed. But this is how uh, the, the story of Acts doesn't end with that, but instead ends with these words. He lived there two whole years at his own expense, or we can see in the footnote here, or in his own hired dwelling, and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So those are the words that wrap up the book of Acts. And if we, if we look at some of these things here, uh, we can see that he is in his own place. So he's not in, uh, in some kind of a, a prison of Rome. Even though, he's, even though Rome is holding him for trial, he's kind of on, on house arrest. But that puts him into a position where he can have visitors, people coming and going. And we can see that uh, Paul is always pressing forward, and he's always uh, continuing with the purpose of spreading the gospel and the message about who Jesus is. And, and that's his, his whole purpose for living. And he continues that even though he is in prison and he encourages others to continue to do the same. One of the things that is interesting here, and I've, and I've heard uh, or, or read some things uh, about this, it says he was proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. So those things we can look at as two distinct things, two separate and distinct things. One is this message of the kingdom, which is what Jesus preached. Uh, Jesus didn't go around uh, so much talking about himself, even though he did he did make comments about who he was and what his purpose was and why he was here and uh, but but he spoke about the kingdom of God so Paul also is proclaiming the kingdom of God but then it goes on to say he was teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ and for us as followers of Jesus not only do we look at the teachings that Jesus presented during his ministry, but we look at who Jesus is himself. And of course, for us as Christians, we've gone on to, uh, to dive deeply into trying to understand how Jesus Christ, Christ meaning the anointed one uh, or the holy one, how is Jesus Christ at one with God? Or how is Jesus Christ God himself? And that gets into, you know, what the church debated about uh, for centuries uh, right after Jesus, uh, trying to figure out who he really was because they believed he was divine. And that we end up with the doctrine of the Trinity, which would be, uh, you know, that, 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 uh, that God is in the flesh. God is in time and space. God is relatable and intimate with us. And yet at the same time, God is completely beyond us, the source of all things that exists and is a, a, a mystery that we cannot touch as we are limited to time and space. We, we can relate to God because of Jesus Christ, because God comes to us in time and space. So these are things that Jesus didn't talk about. These are things, even when it says teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul doesn't get into the, the depth of the doctrine of the Trinity. That's something that the church uh, does you know, with, with time. And I think both of those things are very important for us. I think some of us as, as Christians, we might focus on one or the other. We might say what's most important is to know who Jesus is and who, to believe in Jesus. Uh, the, the big question is, but do you understand what Jesus was trying to, to teach during his day? He didn't spend all his time talking about the Trinity and talking about how you need to believe who I am. 
but he came teaching what he considered to be important. That's the message of the kingdom of God. And then, of course, here we see that it ends, uh, the, the book of Acts ends with this boldness and without hindrance. And that means he just continued on. Nothing got in the way, even prison, even even death, nothing got in the way. We can see that with the example of Christ. Nothing will get in the way of God's intentions for this life, God's intention for all of creation. And, and, and we're called to enter into what God is doing in the world. And that's, that's really what the message of the kingdom and what Christ is all about. Let's look and see... Uh, uh, a couple more things. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, Acts never set out to tell Paul's story. That's why it, it, even though there is a, you know, a lot written about Paul in the book of Acts, in his own, you know, personal journey, it's not all about Paul. It's not all about Peter. It's not all about the twelve disciples. This is about the Holy Spirit continuing the ministry of Christ as the church. <clears throat> and, um, and, and that's why it ends the way that it does. Even though it is talking about Paul's specific situation, it ultimately is saying this message of the kingdom and who Jesus is, this is what's important. This is where the Holy Spirit is working. This is what the Holy Spirit is revealing. And uh, so it's a good way it's a good way to end. We see that Acts tells a story about the perseverance of the Word of God, uh, as we're uh, just, just mentioning. And uh, we have again here, proclaimers of the good news come and go, but the proclamation continues. The proclamation. That's something that's good for us to remember as, as followers of Jesus. I've, I've heard this. I've heard this said from many different people that no one is indispensable, whether it has to do with uh, personal relationships, whether it has to do with a church or some kind of an organization, a company, uh, whatever it is, uh, nobody is indispensable. We keep going on even though we as individuals come and go. The same is true with the gospel. The gospel will continue. The gospel will continue to be proclaimed. The intentions of God will continue to be known in the world. And we can choose as we're living here uh, in these bodies and during the time that's allotted to us, we can, we can move into those purposes and be a part of those things and enjoy those things and, uh, and help to experience the energy of those things and, and, and help in some way. But what, uh, what we must remember is even if it looks like it's not working out, let's say, you know, we, we, we come on the scene and we, we really get way off track or, or we die, whatever, w whatever it means, just because we're not doing our part doesn't mean that the gospel won't continue. And um, that's the power of the gospel. It's good to be a part of it. But ultimately, God's work will be done. And nothing, nothing can stop that. And we'll just wrap up with these words. The, the Roman Empire might control Paul's body and restrict his movement, but no one can subdue the influence of his ministry uh, or the influence that his ministry still has. And then we have that last word, unhindered. Unhindered. And uh, so... Let's see if there's there is a, a few more things here. So Jason says, I always thought that Acts was a chronological statement of how Christianity was spread to the world. Of course, Paul had a significant part in this. Yes. And one of the things that that we've seen that um, a lot of times we will we will look to as what is the chronology of the book of Acts. Oftentimes we look at. Uh, the statement of Jesus saying you must take this message from Jerusalem to Samaria to to the ends of the earth and for I guess for uh, for the known world for the world that uh, that was kind of dominated by the Roman Empire which is really what uh, 
the context that, that these books of the Bible were written in, that was kind of the center of the world. They went from Jerusalem all the way to Rome. So in a way, it's this like, um, not only th- does this have to do with space, but this has to do with time as well. We're carrying out the message. We're, we're, getting, it, we're getting it spread. If you make it to Rome, everything kind of goes out from Rome. So if something came all the way from little old Jerusalem all the way to Rome, then it's going to spread uh, even more. And of course, that's what we see in history. We see that as soon as, uh, as soon as the message of the gospel got to Rome, it just took a few generations, and then it eventually be, it became the uh, the official, uh, or the officially recognized uh, religion of the Roman Empire itself. And of course, like you said, uh, Jason Paul had a significant part to play. Uh, in this and it is you know it is laid out chronologically indeed Um, and we just have uh, Matthew Skinner chose not to do the chronological route just to stay on thematic topic so uh, here we see that our job in is is to also follow in those steps so Acts urges us to affirm the Spirit became apparent when believers bear witness together through their expressions of mutuality, solidarity, worship, reconciliation, and charity. And then we see that um, they're also urged to open themselves to the fullness of God's grace where they, uh, when they become places that are more hospitable, more inclusive, more forgiving, more daring. This is, this is one way that we can look at what the message of the kingdom of God and who Christ is, what it does. One of the things that it does is it brings together. It brings people together in, in spite of differences, whether it has to do with age or gender or culture or race, uh, w- whatever that is, we can see that w- when the message of the gospel uh, is proclaimed and people start to kind of make it a part of their lives, they find that, that the, the essence of what God has in store for us, we hold uh, uh, in common and it's so powerful that those differences fade in a way. So we have expressions of mutuality, solidarity, worship, reconciliation, charity. Those are all words about bringing together. Com, you know, charity is a word that's used to mean giving, and uh, but charity is also a word that, that means love. So we're, we're brought together, and then we are encouraged to continue to, to be flexible enough to watch the grace of God and the movement of the Holy Spirit include more people and, and more types of people than we would have thought could come together so that is where we have hospitality inclusiveness forgiveness and and being daring and bold so that's something that we're encouraged to do as well all right and then let's just uh, this is the last paragraph of the text and let's uh, look at this acts implores us don't look back on memories about the ancient church with nostalgia instead look back into acts to reassure you about your future for god remains as faithful as ever set your sights on where the word of god might be perceptible in both fresh and familiar ways now and in the days to come we will never truly catch up with the spirit but we can remain in hot and joyful pursuit if we expand our outlook committing ourselves to creative abandon and resolute hope in our shared lives, then what else will we discover God is making possible? So a great, a great way to, to wrap up this book here by uh, Matthew Skinner. So we're, we're, we look at Acts with encouragement that this is our story we can see what God has done, and we should watch to see what God is continuing to do. So we, we set our sights on where we can see what God is doing.
We won't catch up with the Spirit, but we can, but we can follow. All right. What I would like to do is I'm going to share with you kind of some thoughts, uh, so kind of where I'm at right now. So uh, I, I will be going on sabbatical starting June, the f- uh, just sorry, July the 5th, uh, and all the way through August the 23rd. And uh, during that time, we have some wonderful pastors who will be filling in. We will continue uh, as we usually do uh, as Faith Church. Our Bible study, we will put on hold for those seven weeks. So, and then we'll start right back up. So we'll kind of give Bible study your own sabbatical, your own chance to kind of recover, take a breath. And, you know, you, you, of course, you can always continue in your own studies. But for those seven weeks, we will take off Uh, where I'm working right now and kind of in my own mind is we I have three Sundays left before I begin sabbatical. And I thought the other day, what might be three important sermons? And then I thought, what are the most important sermon topics? Um. What, what what's the most important thing for us to be uh, aware that are foundational um, sermon topics would be, you know, what are those topics that we should always be coming back to that are always important uh, that, again, are the foundation of the church of God's intentions in this world? Can can we just just for the sake of 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 trying to maybe prioritize or focus on what's truly important and what will help us to put everything else in its in its right perspective what are those things and I, i'm going to invite you this morning to go ahead and share your own thoughts if you would we've had already some good uh kind of introductory comments here this morning uh, our group uh, here this morning is mostly online. So uh, those of you who are online, if you would, in the comments, go ahead and let me know what you think are the most important topics for us as Christians. What should we focus on? Uh, you know, w- when we're, when we're w- we, we have a lot of information in this world today that can uh, catch our attention, that can be distracting, uh, that can, uh, we, we call them rabbit holes or can of worms. We have these, we have these things that we can kind of get obsessed with for a time. Uh, but, but many of the things that we experience in life, they tend to be more temporary. Maybe they bring some kind of enjoyment, fulfillment, have some kind of a side purpose. But at the end of the day, what are we always coming back to? What is ultimately uh, the most important? So please put those what your what your thoughts are in in the comments here. And I'd like for us to go ahead and I'll show you kind of what I do uh, in in studying, uh, not only for sermon preparation, but, you know, studying for topics. One is to go and try to find what the scripture says. So if I'm going to be uh, talking about something like forgiveness, if I'm going to be talking about something like love, if I'm going to be talking about something uh, like justice, or maybe talking about um, reconciliation, uh, what about solving problems? Or what about, as we sang this morning, what about trust in God? So you can take those simple words or phrases and you can plug them into something like what uh, I use here, Bible Gateway, uh, and uh, it will it will do a search. So please place your comments in there on what you think is most important. One of the things that I'm going to go ahead and do is um, I'm going to go to Bible Gateway and just to give you an example... All right, so if I go to Bible Gateway and I just am looking at 
the word love. Love is what's is what's important. And uh, Jason, thank you for your comment that you and Pat really enjoyed the book. I did too. We don't always bat we don't bat a thousand percent in Bible study when we pick books. <laughs> I don't know what our, our I don't know what our batting average is, but uh, so. If I, if I plug in love, I don't want to make you dizzy here, but if I plug in love up here in the search engine and I, and I hit search, one of the first things that Bible Gateway does is it gives a suggested result. So this is probably going to be the most popular result. And then if I continue to scroll down, I can see it's going to start with Genesis and it's going to give me every single place within the scriptures. If you look on the right-hand side, you can see all the different places we see the word love. 19 times in Genesis, Exodus, there's five, Leviticus and Numbers 2, Deuteronomy 17. So we just, we can see all this, Proverbs 25 times. And uh, then we look, uh, we're through the, uh, into the New Testament. Look at John. John has 39 times. That's really important to John. Ephesians has 14 uh, all the way to 1 John, John again, 26 times. So John's big uh, on, on love. And so, you know, you can look and see what does Matthew have to say about love or what does Hosea have to say about love. And so uh, we can, of course, just go straight and look at the first result. This is the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, the gift of love, and that's the whole I. If I speak with tongues of mortals and angels, but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And this will go on to uh, the, the text that we see at funerals, at weddings, love is patient, love is kind, etc. So that's one of the ways that we can, uh, can do that. So I see we've got a couple comments. Funny you said forgiveness. That, I think, is so foundational to life. And then, uh, thank you, Margaret. And then Diane. I think if we keep God in our hearts, everything else falls into place. So forgiveness, uh, kind of the, the centrality of, of, uh, God, of God in our lives. So uh, one of the first things that I do is I just, is I just kind of say, okay, if I think of the word forgiveness, what comes to mind in terms of the Bible? Um, uh, maybe one of the first things I think about is uh, them asking the disciples asking Jesus during his ministry, how often or how many times should we forgive someone up to seven times? And Jesus says, no, you should forgive them 77 times or seven times 70. Um, Jesus response is you should always be forgiving. And um, so that would that would be one. Let's let's think about forgiveness. If we think about keeping God first in our hearts, uh, one of the one of the first things I think about uh, the Old Testament text in Deuteronomy. Uh, this is the Shema. This is the uh, the Shema is Israel's call to to worship or call to what is most important. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. All right, so that's the, sh that's the Shema. That's, that is the foundation for Israel's covenant with God. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God. So if they keep that central, the, sh the Shema is, is considered to be the central call to the covenant. And then you get into how that how that uh, continues with the covenant and how we relate to each other and relate to the world. When Jesus is asked what's the most important uh, commandment, that's what he recites. He recites the thing that all the Jews would say is the right answer. And then he goes on to say, and equal to that, which is, is a a bold and maybe heretical statement equal to that is love your neighbor as yourself so uh, John gets into saying uh, you know we see John talked a lot about love and I think it's in first John where it says if if we don't love each other then we don't really love God because you can't love God and not love people if you don't love people you don't love God 
So love of God, uh, that's, that's foundational as, as well. When we look at the cross and we think about the cross, this is a symbol of both of these things. It's a, it's a symbol of forgiveness and reconciliation. It's also a symbol of love, unconditional, uh, self-giving, giving everything uh, all the way to, to the point of death. That shows us how much God is giving for us and to us. And then, uh, Jason, I believe the three most important topics that need to be covered are unity with other Christians, forgiveness of others, and creation. All right, so we've covered forgiveness. Another part of this would be unity with other Christians. So this is probably something that falls into the love category. Uh, if, if, we, if we just think in practical terms of the way that we love one another, uh, when we love one another, um, if, if this is a... The, okay, so, so first of all, there kind of is two major types of love. One is the, the type that you can't help, uh, which I would say... Uh, first and foremost would be like a love of family or a love of, uh, of children, a love of parents. This is the type of love that um, it, it just flows from the inside out. We have this, this human connectedness that is, it is in, in, inbred or embedded within us. Uh, I have heard some interesting positions from an evolutionary perspective and of course in the study of evolution there's always the look uh, always looking to how does one life form continue to the next generation that is the key to the kind of the evolutionary principle if you cannot if you cannot reproduce and become the next generation, then you cease to exist or you cease to evolve. And so when you evolve from one generation to the next, uh, how, do you, how, do you, um, how do you make that happen? How do you preserve that? How do you nurture that so that that next generation continues to do the same? So this, is, this does have to do with just procreation but it also would have to do with uh you know th the um the type of life that is is being lived so we can see this as humans uh there is a there's a question about what is this love bond between uh generations and i remember one article or 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 video or something like that talking about if you if you do studies and you look at the way that one person will relate to someone else, if, if they're faced with several different possibilities, they will tend to put more attention and effort on the person whose DNA is most like their own. And, uh, and so this would be parents to children. But this would also uh, be... Uh, like, uh, like for example, uh, my uh, I, I have I have two brothers, and there would be other siblings. So that person's DNA, your your sibling's DNA, is probably if you if you share the same two parents, is going to be the closest uh, to yours than anybody else's. It's going to be closer than your parents because you're taking about 50-50 DNA from your parents, but from your siblings, you're sharing uh, even more than that. So that means, you know, even your nieces and nephews and your children, in some ways, there can be up to like 50% of DNA shared with there. So there's this love connection, there's this human connection, this DNA connection that we share and so that's something that's naturally there and that we enjoy and that we preserve and, and we, we notice, okay, this is, this is something key to life. Now, when we shift and talk about unity among other Christians, how could we apply that principle uh, to, uh, to that? 
if we're going to play the uh, kind of the metaphor of this DNA thing, what we could say is, what is the spiritual DNA that we all share? And, and how closely connected are we to one another? Now, one of the, f- one of the things that we might immediately recognize uh, as different uh, we, we, if we recognize differences among other Christians similar, uh, that, are, that are different from, from us, uh, we may think that if we see a difference on the surface or, or just by initial observation, that there's a fundamental difference between us. For example, if, if, you, if you grow up seeing people baptized as children with with water being poured over their their forehead and you go into a church where there's a big dunking tank or baptismal uh, where people are putting uh, usually people are putting on some kind of robes or something and they're walking in it and they're just being immersed like a big bathtub uh, for baptism that would catch our attention uh, it also might catch our attention the difference between passing a tray of bread and and little cups down the aisle and everybody taking one versus everyone coming forward and maybe even opening their mouths and receiving uh, the bread uh, uh, and then everyone not really partaking in the wine but having the priest take the wine. That could stand apart. It might be in our worship expressions that, you know, we can come into some churches that are very solemn and very holy and very... Uh, in, in general, quiet, and uh, we can go into other places that are very loud and are very, uh, almost more along the lines of some kind of a concert that you go to, and we'd say those are big differences. But if we look more closely at the DNA, behind the scenes or, or uh, underneath the skin, if we look more closely at, at the things that we have in common, sometimes those outward expressions, uh, they, they pale in comparison to the similarities that we might have within ourselves. Uh, the things that we share, the centrality of the gospel. You know, you can have two very different worship services, but then you could find that those two churches share a same passion for caring for the homeless or something like that. So with even though these outward worship expressions are different, we have this, uh, this other thing, this call to mission and charity that's very much the same. So, uh, Jason, when you talk about unity among other Christians, there are those things that I think are easily identifiable, and then there are those things that are more, more in common that we would share that, that might bind us together m- more strongly or more deeply. If you're looking at DNA, if, if you're going to compare, you know, if you're looking at brothers and sisters, um, y- my, my wife comes from a, a very large family, and there are lots of girls, and uh, one, one sister has blonde hair and blue eyes, and another sister has um, dark hair and, and dark eyes. Uh, some have lighter s- color skin, and some have uh, darker color skin. You know, some, th- they're all relatively short, so that, that they <laughs> have in common. But not everybody in the family is, is, is shorter. Um, m- my point is when we're looking at, you know, even though we share DNA with siblings, taking from the same parents uh, and, and, and blending it all, mixing it all together, uh, we can come out outwardly looking like we're very different. But if you look at the personalities of all those sisters, there are some that are much closer, even, you know, even if they look alike or not. Uh, and then we have creation. Creation is a big topic, uh, really, for, for the world, for everybody. We're at a place in, in human history that is very unique uh, we really have some insight that nobody else in the church r- saw or recognized um, and, until recently. If you think about the, the, the thing, you know, we have, there are some wonderful pictures of earth 
taken from space, taken from the moon, taken from satellites, to be able to see the planet that we live on, I mean, we, we take it for granted, but that is an amazing gift that we have been given to be able to look at ourselves and to see, you know, whether it's the weather patterns or the continents, we can see this whole world. At least uh, we can see a picture of it, and there have been some that have seen it with their own eyes. Before that, before I think it was Copernicus, uh, before that there was uh, the times of the Bible, and even, I don't know, 1,500 years after that, all of this human history viewed the reality as what's called a three-tiered universe. So you have the you have the earth, the surface, you have the heavens above the earth, and then you have the water below the earth. Uh, or, you know, so, some have broken that into heaven and hell and then the middle ground that we're in. But it is not like a three-dimensional uh, creation of a sphere of a planet that we live on, but instead it is, it's like a flat earth theory with this is the plane of our existence and then there's an existence below us and there's an existence above us. How far down does it go? How far up does it go? You know, who, who knows? Uh, ours is, is three-dimensional. If you go up to the heavens, you can be, you know, that's a, that's a different direction if you're in the North Pole than it is pointing up from somewhere on the equator you know, one is going out that way, one is going up this way. So heaven is out. <laughs> and then the earth below would actually be very finite because it would just be the surface of the globe all the way to the core of, uh, of the globe. Um, so when we look at creation, we're looking at it very differently today than the church has before. So we're not going to, what we're going to see previously is going to is going to look very different than today one of the things that we that we can recognize now through science and and technology is that we we are having some kind of an impact on the planet now that's that's a can of worms i'm not going to open because everybody's this is one of the hot for some reason it's a, it, it is a hot button issue um no, we're not ruining the planet. It's, it's fine, and we're just going through the natural cycles we've always gone through. The other is uh, we're ruining it so badly that within a few generations, it's going to be unchangeable, irreparable, and we're going to destroy at least our own lives as humans on this planet, and then the earth will be left to itself to regenerate, which if it's been around for as long as we think it has, it probably won't have any problem doing that. How do we care for and, and how do we be good stewards of this earth that we're on, this, uh, this planet that we're on? All right. I can see we've got another comment here. This is probably not a person in our Bible study. All right, so sorry about this. Reggie, I'm going to hide that. All right. If there are any others, I would, I would welcome your input. One of the things we could do is do a, 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 quick, a quick look at some of these topics that we brought up. So why don't we do uh, forgiveness? And I'm just typing that in uh, directly to Bible Gateway. I'm hitting search, and let's see what kind of results we have. So the first suggested result that we have is Colossians 1.14, and I'm going to look at it in context. All right. So this would be uh, Colossians is the letter that Paul wrote to, uh, to the church at Colossae, I think it is. 
and he's talking about Christ. He says, Christ has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. And if we look at the little footnote, we can see other ancient authorities add through his blood. All right. So that's just one example of if, you, if you're looking to the scriptures to see what does the scriptures have to say about forgiveness? Well, we would say that forgiveness ultimately is coming from God. Uh, it, when, we, when we receive redemption and forgiveness of sins, this is connected with us being pulled out of the darkness. Uh, and this is transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. Here again, we're talking about the kingdom of God. Uh, so f- forgiveness is, of course, central, if we, especially if we see through his blood. This would be a reference to the cross. So we, we have an example of God's forgiveness in the self-giving sacrifice of, of the Son. We can see that we, uh, if we're around life long enough, we know that life does have its challenges it does have its th- the, the things that are, um, y- you know, th- the, the hard parts of life. Uh, these things at times can be overwhelming. They can, they can pull us down. And, w- and it, can be, it can be that we are feeling oppressed by these outside or inside forces. Uh, it, we can be overwhelmed with anxiety and fear and dread. Uh, we, we can also be overwhelmed by the things around us. We could, we could experience violence uh, or we could experience hatred. And, and so with forgiveness, what we're seeing is that even though something is wrong, even though something is overwhelming to us, even though something looks really, 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 really bad, as bad as it can be, through God, we can be rescued. That's the, that's the word that um, Colossians uses. That's why we use the term salvation. We can be rescued from these things in life that are the worst. We can be saved from those things. It, it lets us know that the, there are things in life that are just beyond our control and beyond our capacity to... Uh, beyond our capacity to be able to handle. And so we need intervention, rescue, salvation. We need forgiveness. Uh, I think usually when we think of forgiveness, we think uh, I did something under my control uh, that I could have done better, that I should have done better, and I, and I, did, it, I did something wrong, and I need that to be fixed. Forgiveness is there too for that that means to help make things right that were that were wrong we have that given to us it's it's it that is within our power but then we also have things that are beyond our control and we have salvation and rescue uh, for that as well so they're kind of in the they're, they're kind of in the same vein if you think about it sometimes we might even say that the the um, the the power to forgive sometimes feels like even that is beyond our control, where it's like I can't bring myself to forgive, and I never I never thought that I would be to that place, and I always thought, well, you you should just tough it up and do the right thing, but I've been to to places where I s- I've just kind of maybe I've made the I made the decision. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to forgive. Even though I know I should, for that, I'm not going to do it. Um, so in a sense, I, I don't know if that means it's still in my control or, or I just I couldn't do it. And, and maybe that's, I couldn't bring myself to do it. Um, but we do need God's help. Like in all things, we do need God's help with forgiveness, whether it's uh, our relationship to God, our relationship to those around us, or their relationship to us. We need God to kind of make things make things right. Uh, let's look at... Um, 
Uh, let's see. I'm I'm now looking at um, at the love topic. I'm going to go ahead now. Oh, let me just show you what I did here. So I put in love the Lord because I'm thinking about that text. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. I didn't get it in the initial results here. I didn't get it in the suggested result. This is the New Te Testament version. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Uh, are your heart, your soul, and with all your mind. That's Jesus quoting. I, I do know just from my own mind that that, that is taken from, uh, uh, from Deuteronomy. And so when I look at Deuteronomy, if I click on it on the side there, these are all the of the results from Deuteronomy, and there it is. You shall love the Lord your God. So this is, again, I, I mentioned it's the Shema. So now we have found Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. So that's where it's taken from, and then Jesus, um, Jesus agrees. Oops. I'm going to get you stuck in a loop if I do that. All right, so uh, that's that's what we can find. You know, that's what we can find about love. I do see we have some more comments here. How do we ask God to make things right? Who? That's big. Thanks for that one, uh, Diane. Let's talk about that for a moment. Um, how do we ask God to make things right? <clears throat> That actually is one of the things, as I was thinking through my list of the, like the three most important sermon topics or the three most important Christian topics, I thought about problem solving. Uh, how do we address problems? How do we fix things? Uh, this is a, you know, if you're going to teach if you're going to teach a child as, as they're growing up, that's one of the things that, that we tend to focus on is problem solving. And it starts very young. You know, we, we, I don't know if you, if you remember these little, uh, I remember this little kind of, it's almost like a little bench, and it has these different holes in it, and the holes are different shapes. It's a square shape, and it's a circle shape, and it's a triangle shape. And then you have these blocks. And they have to solve the problem of how, how do you fit the right block into the right shape. So that's, that's super foundational problem solving. We get into things like, you know, if, if, if your marriage is not working, how do you fix it? All right, that's a little more complicated than fitting the the right shape into the <laughs> into the right hole of uh, but this is this is much more complicated this is uh, this is you know when we get into personal relationship this is much more complicated but at the end of the day we're trying to solve a problem so that's a question i have how do, how do we uh how are we directed to solve problems in life now you, now we're going to get into uh, like you said here, uh, Diane, when it's out of our control without God to do something. So how, how, do we, um, how do we ask God? So I keep coming back to the serenity prayer. And um, I'm just going to go ahead and let's see if we can read it together. All right, this is from the website Celebrate Recovery. This is the, the longer version here, but I'm going to share it with you. And this is, uh, we consider to be from Reinhold Niebuhr. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. That tends to be kind of the short version of the serenity prayer that, that you may have heard. Now, 
this is the rest of it is something we don't always see. Uh, maybe if you're a part of a support group, you'd be familiar with it. But let's continue. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. I'm going to leave this up on the screen just uh, just for a moment. If if you're looking, this is a just a powerful, powerful prayer. You can look at, you can go to CelebrateRecovery.com. That's one of the support groups uh, that would use the serenity prayer. The rest of the prayer, the, you know, the first part is big. Accept the things, accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can. Wisdom to know the difference. And, uh, and again, often we end there. Uh, this has to do with problem solving. So if you can figure it out, if you maybe you just need a little push or you need a little encouragement or you need a little uh, wisdom or uh, I, I guess I guess I said courage already. Um, you can you can change things and you can do things. You've you've got it. You've got it built in uh, to you as a human. You're, you've learned over the years. We know how to fix things, and we can do it. And oftentimes, we just need that extra push or maybe that extra piece of information that helps us to do that. These would be things in the realms of, of, of our control. But this next part has to do with what if there are things I know that I cannot change? Now, uh, Diane, you said, how do we ask God to make things right? Uh, and that's a phrase that we often use. We see something is wrong. Something is out of joint, out of whack. And we may try to fix it, but we realize we can't. We need God to do it. How do we ask God for that? Let's read this prayer one more, uh, one more time, the second half of it. I think there's some keys here. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace now i remember reading this prayer for the first time or hearing this prayer for the first time i did not like that and there's probably still part of me that doesn't and that would be accepting the things that are not right that would be our hardship accepting that somehow those things are a pathway to peace so sometimes there are things that we say, this is wrong, this needs to be made right, this is broken, it needs to be fixed, and we put a lot of effort into trying to change it, and what's happening is this could possibly be a tool that God is using, this hardship, as a pathway toward peace. There may be some things that are broken that in your lifetime, in my lifetime, they will not be fixed. So can this still be, this hardship of an unfixable problem, can this be a pathway to peace? The answer is yes. Taking as Jesus did the sinful world as it is, even though it's broken, as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right you will make all things right if, now there's a, there's a big one there, if I surrender to your will. Now that, that we could get into the, the whole, if I surrender, does that mean God will make it right? And if I don't surrender, that means God won't. I, there may be some, some, there may be some truth to if you can surrender, which is the opposite of doing something, and it's the opposite of effort, if you can surrender, if you can give up, if you can drop, if you can drop it, <laughs> if you can leave it alone and surrender and say, I, God, I trust you, and I'm not going to try anymore, and I'm not, 
you know, th- this is not my prop. This is completely stepping away, completely giving it up. If we surrender to God's will, then I think if anything changes, our perception of how God makes things right changes. And what if God's purpose is for us to surrender? You know, that's that we can look at. And then this is I this is another part that I n- did not like. I don't know, I still don't know if I like it. So that I might be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you in the next. All right. So that's that's a way of saying if we surrender to God, we God will take care of things. So that's another that's another huge topic I think is surrender. Um yeah, so still working on these on these uh, topics. I can see that uh, our time is up. It has been a joy to be with you. And uh, I wanted to just wrap up that, uh, that text. I wanted to hear what you had to say about important sermon topics. I, I am grateful for your input. And... Um, I uh, will we will see what the next couple weeks uh, involve with our Bible study, but I think it's going to be good no matter what it is. All right, let's uh, sing our closing song together. <clears throat> Send us out in the power of your spirit, Lord. May our lives bring Jesus to the world. May each thought us out in your spirit, Lord, we pray. Send us out in the power of your spirit, Lord. May our lives bring Jesus to the world. May each thought and word bring glory to your name. Send us out in your spirit, Lord, we pray. All right, thanks so much for joining. Uh, Enjoyed being with you, and I look forward to seeing you again next time. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.